coffee break with me. Come and take your coffee break with me. Come and take your coffee. Come and take your coffee. Come and take your coffee break with me. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's show. My guest today is Samantha Ray Lopez. We welcome her back to the show, and she is the creator and host of the Creatives Potluck Podcast, and she's done many other podcasts as well. So, Samantha, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, I'm so happy to be back. I know. It's awesome that you have this podcast. It's the second season, actually, of the Creatives Potluck Podcast. But the first season was originally what kicked off your kind of foray into the podcast world, right? So can mm -hmm. you talk about that and, and, and just what the message is behind this podcast? Sure, yeah. So the Creative Spotluck podcast, um, that was kind of the first show that I kind of allowed myself to create. And that really started this chain of events that led me to create like four other shows within the past year. Um, but prior to that, I was actually on a show with a couple of friends and uh, it was called the critics or it was called critics on tap. And we basically just went to the movies, talked about those movies, you know, and all of us were like filmmakers or, you know, related to film in some capacity. So it was fun. Um, at the time, I was also doing stand up comedy. So I thought it was a great opportunity for me to kind of have more mic time and, um, you know, just expand my repertoire a little bit. And so the pandemic came and we couldn't go to the movies anymore. So I was like, well, I think this is my chance to just shift into creating my own show. And the idea behind the show, um, the Creative Spotluck podcast is um, I basically want it to be kind of a potluck of resources and tools for people as they navigate their own creative journeys, whether that's just starting out, whether that's shifting from one medium to another, maybe they're running into roadblocks, maybe they're thriving and want to contribute to the potluck in some capacity. I want this to kind of be a place where people can come and they can learn and they can take things away and hopefully, you know, build a relationship with me. And I'm just really putting myself out there in a way that I really have never done before. So that was kind of season one. Um, and then there was a huge gap of time because there was lots happening. And one of the projects that happened within that time was Texas Film in Focus, which was the one that I talked about the last time I was on the show. Um, but I have always had the Creative Spotluck podcast in the back of my mind as I'm coming back to this. I'm, there's going to be a new vision. I've learned all this stuff. Like I'm going to apply it to that and also expand it, right? Like figure out how I can create more of a um, kind of a network of ways people can engage. So, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, but yeah, there was a huge gap of time and now we're back in season two. Um, I posted a, uh, like the first episode back is me basically rambling about why people should come back and how the new vision has kind of updated and changed. And I'm really looking forward to getting like the real meaty episodes out there. And whether you're an artist who's been honing your craft since you were a child or someone who's tapping into their creative energy later in their careers, I want this to be a place where you can find resources, you can be inspired, and hopefully have some fun along the way. I know my creative journey has been you know, long and varied. Um, there have been several detours, some off ramps, and I love to share anything that I found to be useful and helpful. I feel like the podcasts and the YouTube channels and the Instagram accounts that I follow, the ones that I'm the most drawn to are the ones that help me grow as an individual, whether that's personally or in my creative career or my day job career. And I'm, I'm really hoping to be that for y'all. What are some of the episodes this season? Can you talk about some of the people and maybe some of the focus that you're going to take this season on the show? Sure. Yeah. So something that I've really leaned into in the past couple of years has been like productivity tools. And I'm very much a center brained person that am super organized and analytical in some ways and also, you know, creative in my own uh, different ways. And what I want to do is kind of 
merge what I've learned in the productivity space for creatives, right? And make that kind of um, relevant to creatives. So I know people hear the term productivity and think, you know, efficiency, sometimes capitalism, right? Like, how are we getting the most bang out of our buck in kind of a negative way sometimes? Um, but I think as it pertains to creatives, there's a lot of really great tools that can be used when you're feeling like you're running up against something or um, reaching something new or a new season in your life even that can be beneficial to utilize these productivity tools. So um, something I'm really looking forward to is diving into some books that I've read and basically distilling uh, key topics, key takeaways and things like that for people. So if they don't wanna read the book, they don't have to, but they could. Um, and I know that um, a lot of people like to consume this type of stuff really quickly. So episodes are gonna be shorter as well. Um, I'm gonna get some creative coaches on the show as well. Um, artists, of course, will continue to have a voice on the show. And um, the at the end of the season, I'm really hoping to do a series of episodes focused on the artist's way. So I don't know if you're familiar with the artist's way, but it's essentially a 12 week program where you kind of work through your own creative process. So my goal is to get a couple of people to do it with me. And then we can kind of talk about what we've learned through that process, how it helped us, how it didn't help us. Maybe there might be things that, you know, we can give people tips if they want to go through that kind of program, so to speak. So, um, so yeah, it's going to be a wide range. It's not going to be as interview focused as season one was. Um, but hopefully people will be able to find a good, you know, variety of things that work for them. And what I love about this podcast or just even hearing your intro episodes is that you're creating a conversation around creative people and not even just creative people, but people in general who have a passion for something and they really want to go out there and do it. But there are all these sometimes insecurities and our own fear, or maybe other people's expectations that hold us back as people in doing that. Like we were talking before the show started about, and, and I want you to share that about yourself as well, that, you know, when I started co-hosting this show, I had always done videos and I came from the news world. And, and so I knew how to do that. And I interviewed people, but the idea of doing it just as a, a fun thing on my own was really scary. I don't know why, because it shouldn't be, but it was, it was, it was this feeling of, um, can I do it? Am I going to look stupid? Am I going to sound stupid? Are people not even going to care? And, and I feel like that's an important conversation to put out there because I think a lot of people especially in the last couple of years, have really began soul searching, taking a look at their reflection and evaluating where they are in their lives. Mm -hmm. What has that meant for you? And what has that, you know, doing these podcasts and, and kind of coming into your own with it, what has that taught you over the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, it's been a very interesting journey because I think when I first started to identify that I like was a creative person, was very young, obviously, I was in like theater as a kid and all of that stuff. And uh, in high school, my very first, I made my very first short film in high school. And so I was doing like, obviously writing, directing, but the producer stuff too. And I fell in love with filmmaking and I was like, I'm going to school for this, whatever it takes, right? And in the time between high school and going to college, I was like, how do I make sure that I can make good money and that it's, that I'm not like risking a lot, right? And I think that came from a place of fear. Like I was super scared of not doing it right. I, I was very much like a rule follower and got a lot of like positive reinforcement when I was the kid that way. And so, you know, as I got into my college years, I was like, I have to be the best at producing and production management and being an AD because that's what'll keep me in the film industry. Sorry, that's my dog. He has a spoon. <laughs> Um, so I was really leaning into those aspects, right? Because I was too scared and wasn't confident enough to 
lean into any kind of creative practice and make that consistent. Cause in my head, I was like, well, those people don't get paid a lot of money unless they like hit it big. And I'm not that person. Like I just don't have that in me. And I just told myself this story for so long that I couldn't do those creative things because I was better at these other organizational analytical type things. Right. And so I placed myself in places where I was working with creatives and supporting their projects, making sure their projects happened. And that brought a lot of joy for me. And I never really like I kind of put my creativity in a box for a long time. And then, um, you know, fast forward to years later, I'm already in my 30s and haven't really created anything. And um, I went through like a breakup after a long relationship. And someone was like, a, a friend of mine was like, you should do stand up. I think I here, wh- here's what happened. I officiated a wedding. And someone was like, you should do stand up. And I was like, do you, you think that's something that I can do? Like, do people do that? So looked into it, took a class with Valerie Nice, who you've had on the show. And she was super supportive in, you know, this very early my early foray into that and then that just kind of kicked off a lot of things for me i was like well, let me just put myself out there i can do this i can do this and then finally you know spun up my own podcast and then you know there's a lot of organizational and producery type of things you have to do for a show and all of that stuff came super easy to me so as soon as creative potluck season one ended i moved right into tiff voices with my friends that's the it's focused on the selena the series podcast at the same time i was working on the women in film and television austin podcast the whiffed austin podcast um and then moved into season two of tiff voices and then got the opportunity to do texas film in focus which is a 12 part pretty heavy series um and that's probably the biggest project i've ever done being kind of like the creative head so um so yeah i mean looking back on it it's been a lot in just a couple of years and i think for me the biggest lesson has been like just put yourself out there and do it and i luckily i'm not in a place where i'm like seeing people regularly and people aren't really giving me feedback (laughs) negative feedback so i'm just going you know and, and iterating and i'm my own critic in a way that is helpful now so i think it just took a lot for me to get there and then of course throughout the way i've had really supportive friends who are also filmmakers also creatives in different ways so that's just been super helpful for me to be in the same space as these folks and you know be able to talk about these topics that i bring up on the show because you know i i feel that it's important for us to talk about when things are hard so that we can get to a point that we can share you know these are the things that i learned maybe it won't be so hard for you when once you hit this roadblock one thing that's really important that you've mentioned that you mentioned in the intro to the new season was to be very aware of who you're getting that feedback from. And can you expand on that? Because I thought that was a really interesting point and one that we often don't think about until somebody Mm -hmm. actually says it. And of course it makes sense. You should be cautious and think about who you're seeking that feedback from, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think one of the things that I had to quickly shed in the beginning was, I spend a lot of time on the internet. I'm a digital strategist by day and social media strategist, um, you know, in the past. And there's a lot of chatter on the internet, right? And something that I knew going into this was that, you know, I'm about to be a woman on the internet with a voice and I really need to um, start to break down those insecurities around getting feedback from random people or whatever, right? So. I really had to understand that like you're not going to be for everybody you know like people may hate the way my voice sounds other people might love it some people might think that you know oh she's only been doing this for how long like she's not a credible source i don't want to listen to her and fine don't but there are people who do and those people hopefully my podcast will land in their lap in some capacity so if there's anyone watching and you think your friend would like my show send it to them but I think that's something that we all have to take into consideration is that there is no one artist, creative, comedian, actor that everyone loves. You know what I mean? Like everyone could say, 
The Rock is America's sweetheart and there's gonna be someone out there who, who hates him or whatever, you know? And for me, I'm like, I get my joy out of doing the work and I wanna be the one that determines who I'm getting this feedback from and know where that intention is coming from. You know what I mean? I could get criticisms from people who could care less on whether or not I improve, but the people that I surround myself by with are the ones that will give me feedback knowing that I'll implement that feedback or that it'll make the show better, it'll make my delivery better, the way that I practice my voice, whatever. So I think that's just something that not only is beneficial for the work that I do, but in general, right? So the relationships that I'm building with all of these folks is really important from the broader perspective too. And I'm glad you you said all of that because, you know, my own thing in news, when I was in news as a reporter, it's a very news voice and, you know, everything was voiced in a very news way. But I was always very self-conscious like in doing something like this because I feel like I'm going to sound too gay and people aren't going to like that. And, and, you know, this is how I normally talk. Like this is Mm -hmm. who I am, my mannerisms. And I think part of being okay with who you are is accepting all of those things and being okay with bringing what you have to the table. Like I love to hear people's stories. I love, you know, sharing that with the world because I do honestly think that if even one or two people see something that I've done or you've done, that this conversation may resonate with them and may help them. It may help Mm -hmm. them get over that hump or or feeling like people are going to think I'm too feminine or they're going to, those are the kind of thoughts that I feel prevent most people from moving forward, whether they don't like the way they look, they don't Mm -hmm. like the way they sound. And in the world of social media, my God, we all are like, it's so difficult to yeah. not compare yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. Comparison is a huge, like, I mean, I, there are so many podcasts out there, right? And I'm like, oh, how come I can't be like that girl? And then I think about all of the things that like, I'm like, oh, but I don't want to put myself on YouTube or I don't want to, you know, whatever. And you really have to break that down because it's like, I'm the only one of me in the world. And this is going to sound cheesy or whatever, but like this did not resonate with me until I was an adult, right? I'm the only person in the world who is doing, who is me, right? And it's up to me on the work that I do uh, myself to keep myself mentally healthy on the topics that I choose to bring to the show, all of that stuff. No one else is doing that work for me. That takes a lot of work. I'm not getting paid to do that work, right? So if someone is going to come at me and give me criticism that's not helpful or not constructive or whatever, then I just have to put them in that category of I'm you're I'm not for you. <laughs> like I'm not the person that you should seek out. Go click on someone else's podcast. And in this age of digital content, it's very much that, right? Just press stop and go listen to someone else's podcast. Don't share it or whatever. What I'm hoping though, is that, you know, I've done this work to, you know, break through some of these insecurities of mine. On the flip side though, I hope that my voice and the fact that like, you know, I am a Chicana living in Texas who's doing my own thing and blah, 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 that that inspires someone of that same, that they see themselves in me in some capacity, right? And like, maybe that's an egocentric thing to say, but when you were talking about, you know, sounding too gay or whatever, like all of those things are so complex and so deeply rooted, but at the same time, there's someone out there listening to you and seeing you and like, oh, well, I can do that too. Like, David's out here doing the thing and like, I can do that too. And there have been so many instances throughout this pandemic where, you know, I'm just on the internet or I'm scrolling or, you know, there was a good chunk of months where that was all I was doing was doom scrolling and saw people like me. And I was like, oh, you know what? I can do that. Or saw people younger than me. Like the next generation is what's inspiring me. Like I am so inspired by these people who are like, I have a mic in the internet or I have a camera in the internet and this is what I'm doing, you know? You know, like you were saying earlier that it's okay to be you, you know, whoever that is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the deeper thing in what you do, the deeper impact of it all and the different podcasts that you do is that you're shining a light 
on people who don't always have a voice. And I told you that before. And I feel like that in itself is, is huge. You know, how do you, um, do you ever think of it that way? Or are you just kind of doing your thing? Like, these are the people I want to interview. And uh, how do you think of it when you approach your different topics and when you approach different people that you find inspiring that you want to interview? Yeah, no, I do think about that. And that is something that's very intentional. I think for me, you know, I've always wanted to work in the indie film space with up and coming filmmakers. I work with film festivals for the purpose of finding up and coming filmmakers, right? And being able to interact with people who are at that stage in their career. And I think that carries over into the many aspects of choosing who's going to be on the show. Um, not everyone is an up and comer, of course, but I think I'm just a curious person by nature. And I want to know more about people who I rarely see on screen behind the scenes. So I want to put that to the forefront for people and give people that opportunity, especially when it pertains to like Texas film, right? I'm a huge proponent of the Texas film industry and how important it is to um, advocate for production, better in production incentives, all of those things. And the only way that people are going to know that is if they hear voices, right? And I think our personal stories are so important. I love hearing where people came from, how they got to where they are, the struggles, the tools, the things that are just that make them tick. And I think there are a lot of people out there who also enjoy that. Um, you know, I, I think that's the rise of podcasts in general is proof of that. And um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I'm, I'm definitely looking for folks who don't necessarily have a platform or their platform is somewhere else and just really giving people new flavors and new things to like, think about and consume instead of, you know, the same old thing that we always see. Yeah. One of the things that you also talked about in, in your podcast, the creative spotlight podcast was the term starving artist. Can you um, enlighten us with that? Because I really felt that that was a, a great conversation that you, that you were having. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the elements that definitely went in, like I said earlier, right. I was like, the only way that I can make good money is if I lead into the organizational aspects of my brain, which is not true. Right. And that is, you know, very much a like capitalist mindset of like, how do I make the most money? And I think that our society is in a place where we're not, we don't value artists the way that we should. And there is so like our society would not operate without you know, people who are like cultural historians and people who maintain music and art and continue these legacies of our society and yet are not getting paid as much as someone who is working in tech, which not to, you know, bash on anyone working in tech because <laughs> that's my day job. But, you know, how do we put those on a scale, right? engineers versus someone who is an artist doing their own work right and i i'd argue that it takes a lot of emotional effort and it is very um i don't want to say draining but it's taxing emotionally personally to do your own thing as an artist right and to be delegated work and to you know be trained to do a skill and and all of that that also takes a lot of effort or whatever. So like, how are we like fairly compensating people? And I think that's, you know, when we zoom out and really think about the labor uh, issues and, and movement in general, there's all of these nuances, right? Systemic issues. But when it comes to artists, I think there's been this kind of romanticization of like, oh, starving artist, or, oh, I don't have a job or, or you know, no one's saying that, you know, we live in, a capitalist society and we need to be able to make money right and why is it that you know we aren't paying artists fairly and we continue to ask photographers hey will you shoot my wedding for free or can i get a logo design for free and i've done my fair share of asking people for free stuff i totally get it but 
why you wouldn't ask your doctor to do something for free, you know? And I, I see that argument happening all the time. And it's like, yeah, how do we not understand that like artists shouldn't be starving? No one should be starving. Right. And, and usually when artists are starting out in any form, they do a lot of things for free, you know, mm -hmm. because it's not viewed as, like you said, it's not at the same level that you would view somebody who's going to be a doctor or something. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, honing your skill is like hours and hours and materials and all of these things. So it's like, yeah, there's just a huge uh, disparity that I think is, you know, disappointing. And then of course you add in the other factors like, you know, being queer people or women of color or anyone at those intersections. And it makes, it makes being an artist less and less attractive from that standpoint. So yeah, I have a, I have an issue with the starving artist romanticization, romanticization, but yeah. <laughs> Do you have any like firm plans of ideas that you'd like to pursue in the future when it comes to content you want to put out there? Yeah, I really want to expand what the creative potluck is. So I, I think I set it up in the beginning thinking, okay, podcast is going to be the main thing, but there's opportunity here and really hadn't thought about it until, you know, when I was going through this whole process of the new vision. And I want to eventually be able to do like a YouTube show. I don't know what that's going to entail, but it's going to be a lot of like mental work too for myself to be on camera. Um, and create more of a web presence. So like have a blog, think about SEO, all of that stuff that like I have to do at work to my day job, blah, blah, blah. Um, so really expanding the creator's potluck. And then outside of that, I mean, I think, you know, I want to leave some space for these opportunities that may come. So last year I was just going from like show to show to show because I really was trying to flex my skills and find what really worked for me. But um, but now I want to be a little bit more intentional on like the other shows I'm working on and what other shows I either consult on or um, or pick up. So I loved working on the 12 part series because it had a beginning and an end and I had kind of a plan going into it. Um, and the creative potluck is a little bit different because it's like, there could always be a season three or whatever. So, yeah, I think, you know, being just a little bit more intentional on new projects and allowing that space. Um, that's all I can say on the short term, because who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> I like to think that, you know, podcasting is where I've landed. But last year I was also exploring um, doing like voice work and uh, animation kind of voice work. And so that might be a thing. So I don't know. I've got a mic and I'm going to try and use it in whatever way I can.